And I'm going to read chapter 5, 15 to 33. Chapter 5, 15 to 33. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is and don't get drunk with wine which leads to reckless actions but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music to the Lord in your heart giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. He's the saviour of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Just as also Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her in the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to begin with something that we take for granted. And I want to ask you a question. Have you ever sat down and just thought how complicated walking is? Now, I know for some people like me who might be a little clumsy, walking is always complicated. Uh, But walking is an incredibly complex activity. Now, I'm only a humble arts student, uh, but I think it would involve at least some of these. Uh, You've got to make decisions You've got to send neural messages. You've got to calculate and work out muscle movements. You've got to recognise terrain and conditions. You've got to choose footsteps, where you're going to place your foot. You've even got to sometimes assess the weather conditions and then you've got to navigate the environment without looking like you're trying too hard. Walking is incredibly complex. You just have to look at a child learning how to walk to see how complicated walking is or someone who is involved in significant rehabilitation. With those people, you can actually see the decisions on their faces, can't you? What do I do now? What message do I send this thing at the end of my body that's meant to move me forward? Walking is incredibly complicated and complex. In fact, it should reinforce for us that whenever you walk, you should walk carefully. You should walk carefully. So it's no mistake that Paul chose the image of walking in this letter to a group of people he loved to describe the Christian life. Over the series we've had as we've looked at this letter from Paul to a bunch of Christians in Ephesus, we've learned that our walks are unique, that our walks reflect who we are, and that walking describes the way we navigate the world. Chapters 1 to 3, Paul wants them to work out who they are. Who are you? And you've got your postcode in Jesus. You're connected to him so that you're not dead anymore but alive. You're now in God's mob. Because of that, chapters 4 to 6, how are you going to walk in the world? Chapter 4, verse 1, walk therefore worthy of the calling you have received. He uses that image again and again and again. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1, 4, 17, 5, 1, 5, 8, and even in today's passage to describe everything about living as God's mob. And just as it is the case with us in our daily life, it's the case with walking as God's people. It takes a lot of thinking and a lot of care. In fact, today, in this last section of Ephesians, before we finish off in chapter 6, he takes it from what some people might describe as the airy fairy to bring it down into our lounge rooms. What do you do in your kitchens? 
How do you relate as a household? Down to the really nitty-gritty stuff that we face every day. And in those situations, he is very clear. Walk carefully as God's people. Let me pray and we're going to dive into it together. Dear God, thanks for your word. Uh, We've been reminded so much about your word this morning. Uh, Please help us to think about a passage that uh, some might find controversial. Help me to speak truthfully. Help us to care for each other winsomely and in grace. In Jesus' name, amen. I remember he's writing this letter uh, in about 60 AD. Paul is in jail in Rome under house arrest. He's writing to a bunch of people in the town of Ephesus, uh, modern-day Turkey, quarter of a million people, cosmopolitan town on the coast, port town. He's spent some time with them, hasn't seen them for seven years, and he's writing to them in order to encourage them to think about who they are and to walk worthy of it. Uh, In that diverse town, this group of God's people is made up of a number of different ethnic groups, different backgrounds. They've got a whole lot of pressure on their identity. Some people have come out of the temple up on the hill, the temple to Diana. Some people are Roman citizens, and so they've been involved in worshipping the emperor of Rome, who's regarded as bringing peace in our time. Others have come out of the Jewish background, Israel, God's people, and there's a synagogue around the corner. All these various pressures on their identity. And Paul writes them and says, you're in God's mob. Remember some of the images he used in chapter 2? You were dead and now you're alive. Uh, You were enemies, but now you're united. You're people whom God loves and has shown that in Jesus Christ, who lived, died and rose for people like you. So walk like it. Walk like your postcode. Chapter 4, verse 1, uh, walk as a household that's growing and being built up. Chapter 4, verse 17, don't, don't walk the way you used to walk. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1, a walk in the family likeness. Uh, uh, last week, as Neil talked to us about that section uh, in chapter 5 that leads up to this one, uh, walk in a way that shows your children of light, that has a, a maximum impact. Which brings us to verse 15, point two on the outline. Pay careful attention then to how you walk. Not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. You've got to walk with maximum impact. That's really what God's people are about as they live as a household in a wider community. Uh, to represent the household, the family likeness, faithfully. And so you've got to be careful how you walk. You've got to walk wise and not foolish. Now, wisdom's a big theme in the Bible. I'm still learning about that. Uh, But how would you define wisdom? How would you define wisdom? Let me give you a simple definition. I I think it works. Wisdom is the ability to live in the world as God designed it. Wisdom is the ability to live in the world as God designed it. Right throughout the Bible, God's people are encouraged to be wise. Uh, In the Bible, what's the opposite of wise? It's foolish, isn't it? A a wise person is someone who has a realistic assessment of who they are. They're not God. Barely managed to make their own lunch. In fact, they need God. They're convicted of that and so they turn to God and God changes them in his love and brings them into his household. A foolish person goes, I I don't need God. I don't need to navigate the world God's way because I'm God. And I'm making the world in my image. And God's people are to walk as wise people. What does such wisdom look like? Or why do they have to walk that way? Oh, the why is pretty easy to answer. It's there in verse 16. Because the days are evil. Oh, we know the days are evil. Uh, Someone even said to me uh, yesterday at an event completely unconnected to the church as we talked about the fact that there's snow at Perisher, fires on the coast and a drought here. This person said to me, the world's about to end. Well, they got it right. Because the world is mucked up, God said it's not going to last like that forever. It's going to finish. And so there's limited time. Why are we to be wise? Because the world will end. In fact, what does wisdom look like? It says it there in verse 16. It doesn't make the most of the time. Make the most of the time. There is a finish point to this universe. It will end. It is broken and God does not want the brokenness to exist forever. 
And so the days are limited. Make the most of those days. Don't waste them. Don't assume they won't end. They will. There's a famous illustration from John Piper and many of you are aware of it, isn't it? As, a young, as an older couple come to God and he talks to them about how they use their days. And they say, here, look at my shell collection. That's not an advertisement against hobbies or relaxation, but it is an encouragement to use our days to make the most of our time to walk as if our postcode is in Jesus. Now, in case we don't know what that looks like, in verses 17 and 18, he gives us two examples. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions. The time's limited. Don't be foolish. Understand God's design. The time's limited. Don't get drunk. Don't waste your time. Now, they run in tandem saying, this is what a wise world looks like in God's mob. Uh, Let me try to be as blunt as Paul. You'll only know God's will if you do what? If you read God's word. And you'll only know God's will if you read God's word and live in God's household. To say that we know the will of God and then to ignore everything he's ever said is foolish, isn't it? To claim the benefits of the household without making the household a priority? Well, we don't run our households that way, do we? It's a waste of time. And that's the household he turns to in verse 18, isn't he? Because he goes on, did you see that there? He provides something else, but be filled with the Spirit. Verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Now, the last time the Spirit was mentioned was in chapter 2, at there at verses 19 to 22, and I was talking about what God was doing to make a house he could live in. A household fitting for him. And he talked about the Holy Spirit. There is a thing that builds us, changes us and transforms us. So these words here are all about the community. Don't individualise them. It's about the mob gathered together, the household as it meets. They're all plural. And they're all ING words, if you like your English grammar. They're participles. They put the flesh on the bones. I've underlined them there for you. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music to the Lord in your heart. Is there any other group that meets so regularly to sing and actually allows people who can't sing to sing with them? (laughs) There isn't, is there, in Narrabright? We're We're the only group that meets every week to sing. And we're made up of people of such diverse backgrounds. Our weeks have been so different. The week to come will be so different. But what can we do together now? We can sing because God's made us his mob. That's unique in the world, isn't it? There's no other household that looks like this. And when we do that, did you notice what we're to be like in verse 20? Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not known as the whingers. We're known as the thankful people. The people who turn up and see a face that I've not seen all week and go, you little ripper, I could spend an hour with this person this morning singing because we're in the same mob together. There's no other group in Narrabri that does that. And when we do it, we're submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. The fear or the respect, not the fear as in, oh, he's going to flog me. But it's this is the one who sets the pattern and so we serve each other in the roles and jobs we've been given so that we're built up to be an appropriate household for God. Uh, that's what the submitting means. There's no other group in Narrabri that does that, is there? There's no other group in all of the universe that is such a household. It's magnificent. 
That's magnificent. There is a group, as we just saw from Deb and Chris, there is a group meeting in Papua New Guinea today who could be reading the same passage as us, who in a completely different tongue are doing the same thing we're doing. No other group in Narrabri can say that, can they? That's who we are as the household of God. And that is meant to then seep into our own personal households. That's why he begins with the household of God and then goes on to each of our own households. And I don't like to do this, but I'm going to do this this time. There's no full stop at the end of verse 21 in the original language. There's no full stop there. If anything, there's meant to be a comma and then it just goes on. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ and then let me talk to you about your households, what they look like because of God's household. And if you know what happens next, you have a section on wives and husbands and then you have a section on, and get this straight, fathers and children. And then you have a section on slaves and masters. So uh, the pattern is this. Whatever the pattern in God's household is to be the pattern in our households. The pattern in God's household sets the pattern for our personal households. What happens in this lounge room happens in those lounge rooms. What happens at that dinner table or this dinner table happens at those dinner tables? God's household sets the pattern for our households and the thread that runs through it is a thread that we sometimes find uncomfortable to our modern ears, don't we? Uh, The thread of submission. I I love uh, when a couple comes to me and says, we want to get married, Bernard. You little ripper, you got six sessions with me and we're going to talk about God. It's terrific. So we meet and we talk about the wedding service and we meet and we talk about what it means to be uh, in marriage and I offer them the benefit of my great wisdom and then uh, we look at the Bible passages and look at what they say and this is a passage that you know is going to have a bit of discussion (laughs) because it's our word submission, isn't it? It sits uncomfortable in our modern ears. Uh, We don't like it, I think, because of two reasons. The first is because of how a passage like this and the word submit has been misused. We've got to be blunt. Blokes have abused this passage. Now, did you hear me? Blokes have abused this passage. This passage is not a justification for male dominance, a male dictatorship, and heaven forbid domestic violence. None of that can be justified from this passage. Did you hear me? Very clearly. It has been a passage that has been misused. But secondly, in our society, I think the word submission has changed, hasn't it? Because in our society, submission has now been connected with value or worth, hasn't it? So the person who submits is of less value, less significance, less dignity, less worth. I think if we're going to look at this word in this passage, we've got to do what verse 17 says. Understand what the Lord's will is. So how is this word used across the Bible? That's why we had a reading from Genesis and Revelation. They're our bookends. Marriage at the start, marriage at the end. And the word submission runs as a thread. In the Bible, Submission is always connected to order and roles as God designed it, never connected to your worth or value. It's always connected to order and design as God made it, never connected to value. And you can see that in two really key examples. I've just picked out two. Uh, The first is where the word submission, exactly the same Greek word, is applied to Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 2, verse 51. Now, if you know your Bibles, Jesus has been, well, his parents think he's run off from them in Jerusalem. He's 12. They've gone up there and they've, uh, they've, I think they've probably spent the time doing his bar mitzvah where he's declared as a man and then they go off and then they've lost him. They come back to find him and he says, well, why didn't you look in my father's house? I was always going to be in the temple. And then he goes home, and what does he do with his parents? He submits to them. Now, if you think about that carefully, that's a remarkable statement, isn't it? Because who made Mary and Joseph? 
the 12 year old boy who's submitting to them as the son of God. So when Jesus submits to Mary and Joseph, does that decrease his value as the son of God? Does that decrease his value as a human being? It does, it does it. But it does describe the job he's been given. Even at the cross, where the people he has made, he submits to their violence on behalf of us. The other example is in passages like this, which talk about the roles of genders in marriage, the wife. This is why we began the year with what book of the Bible? Genesis, because there's our worldview. There's our map of the world, because in Genesis chapter 2, what do we learn in Genesis chapter 1 about men and women? In whose image are they both made? In the image of God, both. They are both equally valuable to God because both men and women bear the image of God and no amount of sin has removed that. And so submission in the Bible is not a statement, not a word connected with worth or value, but connected with the design of God of the world and the roles and jobs he's given us. And so even in this section, which I think is why the comma is so important, not the full stop, as men and women fulfill their roles, there's a mutual submission. Submitting to each other in the jobs that we've been given. Now we're going to look at just husbands and wives in a moment. Uh, You'll breathe a sigh of relief, we're not going too long. Uh, But let me just make a couple of quick comments before we dive into that. Uh, The literature of the day would look at this and go, I recognise this. This is a household code. They're all over the ancient world. This is the way the household should work. Uh, And in the time of the day, uh, who's at the centre of the household? It's the bloke. The whole household is defined in connection to him. In fact, everything in the household has a utilitarian value based on the benefit they can bring to the bloke. So when you read it that way, this is an unusual household code, isn't it? Because everyone in the household has value because Jesus Christ died for every member. Your value is defined not by your utility, but by the fact that every human in the household bears the image of God. And in fact, that image is so worthwhile that Jesus Christ gave up everything in order to restore that image. This is more radical than much of the guff we produce today because it says in a world that regarded everything as serving the needs of the man, no. People are made in the image of God and Jesus Christ died for their sins and that changes the tone of every household and every pattern, which brings us to the roles we're looking at today. I'm at point four on the outline, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. He's the saviour of the body. Husbands and wives is the first relationship. Wives are encouraged, and I've used that word encouraged, to submit to their very own husbands. Notice that limit? Their own husbands. And it begs the question of why. Of verse 22, it's not connected to the value but connected to their identity as people in God's household to the Lord. And verse 23, because it works on a pattern, the pattern of Jesus and the church. Now, that is such an important pattern. It sets the tone for this whole passage. It's not new in Ephesians. It's talked about in chapter 4. And there Jesus is described as the head of the church and the church is the body of Jesus. How valuable is the church? The price tag is the Son of God nailed to a cross. That's how valuable the church is. And so submission, again, is not a statement of value, but a statement of role. And it's a statement of role that we'll see in a moment is linked all the way back to Genesis 2. Well, let's turn to the husbands. 
Husbands, love your wives just as also Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Verse 26, to make her holy, cleansing her in the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but holy and blameless. Do you notice something about the section on husbands there? What stands out? There's a word in red. Yeah, blokes, you're commanded. You're commanded to love your wives. What's your pattern? Well, your pattern is the very same love of Christ for the church, which is what in verse 25? Gave himself for her. We know what that means, don't we? It's not to make the wife look like you want her to be, remake her in your image. It's to actually love her in a way that she can be everything that God has designed her to be as the woman he has made her. That's got a spiritual dimension, doesn't it? It's also got a physical dimension. Did you notice that there in verse 29? He provides and cares for her. And so not only does he lead her to know and love Jesus better, but he actually provides all that he can so that that is possible. In case you think this has been brought in because the world's marked up and we need someone uh, to make decisions, well, it, that's all undercut by verse 31, isn't it? Because where does Paul go? Just like Jesus, whenever Jesus is asked about marriage, where does Paul go in order to explain this design? It's Genesis chapter 2, isn't it? Which comes before Genesis 3, if I'm not mistaken. This is the pre-fall design not the post-fall design. This isn't a design that God's thought up because, gee, those humans have mucked it up and I need to make sure things work a bit better. No, this is how God's made it in a perfect world. This is how God has created marriage between a man and a woman. And the significance is huge. Verse 32, this mystery is profound. What, what's profound? Oh, no, no, I'm talking about Christ and the church. You see, God designed marriage this way so that wherever we look in this world, there will be a living, breathing, day-to-day -day example in front of us of how much God loves his people. Now, for a bunch of people who are hearing this for the first time, think Ephesus. For first-generation Christians, that's remarkable, isn't it? I think we've become a bit... Lazy, if you like, with how significant this is. In Ephesus, if anyone in this town wants to see a daily example of the love that led Jesus to the cross for his people, where should they look? At your marriages. At your marriages. And I don't think it's changed, has it? Now, I suspect you've got a whole lot of questions in your minds, haven't you? Some that you want to ask and some that you're not game to ask. Well, let, let me, before I get to the last point, ask some questions and answer them. And then if there are any left, we might have time at the question time. Uh, is the wife inferior because she submits? No, she's not. She's made in the image of God. Jesus Christ died for her. Is the husband a tyrant because the wife submits to him? No, he's not. His role model is Jesus who gave up everything to love her with every fibre of his being. And what does that love look like? Well, it means first and foremost that the husband has a sacrificial love for his wife. That means that on, if you can forgive me pushing the image better, that on the last day he'll be able to say, God, here is the woman that you made as you made her. His love is sacrificial in such a way that he will lead her to know and love Jesus more and more as he does. Are you only meant to live out your role if the other person does? Like a quid pro quo? And no, there's nothing in the passage about that, is there? 
Does the husband make all the decisions? He's a fool if he does. Because that's actually not sacrificial love, is it? Now, I'm sure there are other questions that you might have, and we'll have a chance, I think, in question time to ask them or over morning tea. But let me close very quickly with five observations, and they will be quick. They're there on your outline. I've listed them. Uh, Let me encourage us, firstly, to be careful of our walk. There was a a, a description in the passage Neil preached on last week, which I think captures uh, often me and perhaps you as we live our lives as Christians. We're sleepwalkers. We sleepwalk through life as God's people, not remembering where we've come from, not remembering where we're going, not not taking any significant care. This passage said, don't sleepwalk. (laughs) Take care how you walk. Discern the will of God. Read his word. Secondly, the priority of God's household. Uh, The order is important here, isn't it? Where does he start? God's household. God's household has a priority because God's household is the dwelling place of God so that each of our households will be as God designed it. So what's the priority we put on the meeting of the household of God? The goodness of marriage ordered this way. Let me actually plead with you, encourage you, exhort you. Marriage actually works this way. And it's not something to be belittled. I I, I think we know this in our minds, but I suspect our jokes undermine it. The jokes we make about the roles of men and women. No, no, no. The roles of men and women are based on Jesus Christ and the church. And that is seriously good, isn't it? And we need to treat it that way. Which leads to the fourth observation, the serious goodness of our own personal households. You see, as the household of God operates as God designed it, there in our own personal households, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren will see what it means to walk as part of God's house and how it works. Please don't ever outsource that. We'll look at it next week. Please take seriously the personal goodness of demonstrating daily before children and family the love Jesus has for the church. That's why the connection is so important. And finally, let me encourage you to speak to the evil days, the days we live in. Let me encourage you to present before our community the daily example of Christ's love for the church in marriage as God designed it. Not to present it in a way that is in opposition, so to speak, or shrill. Not to present it in a way that's alarmist or condemnatory, but in a way that actually has the flavour of the very same love it's meant to be showing. Which is gracious and forgiving and kind and wise. Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. I thank you for what you've said here. Father, by your spirit, please apply it to our lives. Father, please forgive us where we need forgiveness. Please strengthen us where we need strengthening. Father, please remove apathy from us if we sleepwalk so that this household and our households displays to this town how much you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Dare I ask any questions? Yeah, right.
So Rod's question for those uh, who didn't hear it is, why does he not express it the way I would have? <laughs> <laughs> so why does, why, does, why does Paul in verses 30, 31 and 32 go, uh, listen, I'm going to quote Genesis 2 and then I'm going to say this mystery is profound but I'm actually talking about Christ in the church and then I'm going to go back to men and women. So Why does he do it that way? I, I think he does it for two reasons. There are others but two that I'll say briefly here. I think we've got to pick up the pattern of the Bible which is why we had a reading from, as Brent said to his little ones, the second chapter of the Bible and the second last chapter. I hadn't picked that but I like the symmetry. Um, but I think it's there because this... Whatever we do now in life as God designed it is actually tied to the whole storyline of the Bible. And one way you can summarise the storyline of the Bible is God looking for the right bride for his boy. And that's the pattern in Genesis 2 and it's the climax, if you noticed, in Revelation 21 because it's the bride coming to get married. And so whatever else you want to say about marriage, as it's designed by God, it is by creation woven into the narrative of the universe. And he wants us to know that. So he's not just talking to the Ephesians isolated in this town and trying to deal with all the pressure. He's saying, you guys, when you do this, you're knit into the creation narrative in a way that God designed to display Jesus. It's big stuff. So I think he wants us to say that. I think secondly, he wants us to go, it is a mystery. <laughs> Not in a mystery like the jokes we make. That's why he's got the word profound there. There is something about the very fabric of our being as human beings who have been saved into God's household that marriage speaks to. And I haven't found anyone who's plumbed the depths of that. And so I think he phrases it that way to anchor it in the narrative of the Bible and also to say, hey, go and have a really big think about this. So they're the two things I'd say now in answer to that question. Yep. Deb? Yep, I, I think that's a, that's a really good um, question. So what does it really look like for a wife to demonstrate submission in a marriage? Now, as I'm answering this, I'm answering it as the husband, okay, as the Bible teacher. And uh, it's been really hilarious in my family growing up watching mum and dad. I, and I can just use examples of mum and dad because they're not here. Um, but at Bible college, who topped Australasia in theology? Mum. Who came dead last? Dad. Who was the minister who led the household? Dad. And so mum actually said, your job is to lead me to know and love Jesus better and I'm going to submit to you, which means I'm going to come under your leadership as you walk me through that. Now that didn't mean dad made all the decisions. But what it did mean is that dad took the initiative to lead, as we're going to learn next week, the family to know and love Jesus more, which set the framework for what submission looked like. What does that look like daily? It could mean all sorts of things. I think one of the wise ways you lead is recognise your limits and recognise your wife's strengths, which means that you will actually work together two in one. So, for example, the husband might be a terrific spender the wife might be a very wise budgeter. He would be a foolish leader to ignore the gifts God has given his wife. And she would not serve him by withholding those gifts from the family. So I think there's some examples. So if you really want to be, I think, husbands, read the Bible with your families. Pray with your wives. I think wives, encourage your husbands to do that with you and make sure that he feels like he can do that with you. I think within the family, husbands lead your wives by recognising your limits and working together as a team. Wives accept that sometimes decisions need to be made and the buck stops somewhere. So that, that's as far as I can go at that point. Deb, does that answer a bit of your question? Terrific. That, for the recording, that's a thumbs up. <laughs> Pete.
Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. There's actually a whole part of the Bible about that, isn't there? What part of the Bible talks about that? Pushing you here, aren't I? 1 Peter. Okay, 1 Peter. Now, it talks about it in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7 where perhaps uh, one of the spouses has become a Christian and the other hasn't. And in that situation, if the one who hasn't become a Christian walks away, then the covenant vow of marriage seems to have been broken. Okay, so that's one extreme. On the other extreme uh, is the situation in 1 Peter chapter 3, and it talks equally to wives and husbands, but the way in which they fulfil their roles is meant to be done in a way that puts the gospel before the unbelieving partner in all its goodness. Are there limits on that? There are limits on that, I think, in two places. Uh, the first is where there is active disobedience towards God encouraged. And I think it's okay there in a winsome, loving manner to say, no, that, no, this is what God says in his word. We get that out of Acts 2 and 4. The other limit is domestic violence. Okay, And in those situations, I would say, leave that environment. Leave that environment. And so in that situation, again, what's been said in Ephesians 5 is very important my job is to be the husband and to do that in such a way that puts Jesus in the family. Yeah. Does that answer your question a bit, Pete? Yep, yeah, terrific. Any other questions? Uh, Kenny and then Nathaniel and then we'll call it a day there. Kenny. I didn't say the only church, did I? No, what did I say? The household of God gathered. Now, that household of God's gathered in a number of places today. So notice I was very careful, okay? I was very careful. When the household gathers, there is something remarkable going on. And that's happening at a number of different street addresses today, okay? So I was very careful about that. Does that answer your question, Kenny? Beauty. Nathaniel? What was that? Um, yeah, I mean, I just set the book and then I worked my way through it. And so next week we're talking about fathers and kids and then how we deal with our slaves. And then the week after we're talking about how to fight the devil. So I just pick a book and then I work from chapter 1, verse 1 to the last chapter. Next year we're doing Habakkuk, and I don't think that mentions marriages, and Colossians, and it only mentions marriages in a little bit. But it's the word of God. That's what I try to do every week. Yeah. We can have a chat over a cuppa. That'll be fine. <laughs>